Governor, um, actions speak louder than words. Right now, outside this auditorium, there are barricades, National Guard, police with body armor and automatic weapons, helicopters, boarded up windows, phone alerts, parking bans, and curfews targeting youth of color, but not white diners. Some people are afraid to step out and protest today for fear that their behavior will be criminalized or worse. Protesters nationwide are talking about the excessive policing of black bodies, and your response, despite very pretty words, is more policing of black youth. <clears throat> So um, I'm not sure who you're reading that from, but I'm happy, I'm happy to address it. Um, the curfew, you have to ask the mayor, because he has imposed the curfew in the, in the city. Uh, the barricades, when it came to my attention, that I don't think they were, they, they were this morning put in front of the State House, and when I saw that, I immediately directed that, that, that they be opened, and if they're not now, they will be by 4.30 because we want, obviously, people ought to be able to protest on the grounds of the State House. It's an incredibly powerful symbol. So rest assured that by 4.30, um, they will be open and people will be allowed to, you know, go to the State House. Um, there is, we, this is very difficult, okay? What we are trying to do is very difficult. We are trying to in, strike the right balance where we enable a peaceful protest during the day, never threatening anyone's right to do that, never in, um, policing against anyone who is appropriately protesting, including, you know, yell. I know the doctor said not to yell, but exercising your rights. Um, we also know that when it gets dark, it's, possible that we could again be um, dealing with some serious violence and we need to be ready for that. So it, you have my commitment uh, and I know the Rhode Island State Police is committed to this and the Rhode Island National Guard is committed to this to make sure that during the day today uh, people feel safe and in no way is law enforcement going to interfere with or be heavy handed with anyone's right to protest. Having said that, um, the helicopters you hear are doing surveillance because we know that we're living in an uncertain time and we need to be ready for what might come. Dr. Scott, um, considering that we had the, uh, the um, protests last week, and, or this week actually, and are expecting to this weekend, is there a model out there for when we might see a spike? Yes. Usually if you have been exposed, it's about 10 to 14 or uh, so days before symptoms begin to develop. Subsequent to that, as symptoms develop, that's when someone can get tested and be able to identify whether or not uh, COVID-19 is what their symptoms are associated with. Uh, that's why we have that 14 to 21 days before we start to see any type of increase. It's also why the governor, when the governor mentioned the quarantine order that was explained earlier today, the reason for that, being able to stay home, is to monitor for symptoms. That's the key. If symptoms develop, you are already home and out of a public venue where the risk of spreading COVID or any other illness for that point is lower. So having that knowledge and understanding is helpful for people um, in general and then those who participate in these types of events as well. I can just follow up. Is, and with that in mind, is your department, the state, have you looked at that? Are you looking at a particular date where you're saying we've got to be ready for this particular day? Yes, that window of time that I've shared, about two weeks out from now. We want to make sure that everyone knows testing is available. Um, particularly if someone's developing symptoms or if there is concern, and just encouraging people who participate to be vigilant about monitoring themselves and have a very low threshold for getting uh, evaluated, getting tested, make sure that you are keeping uh, contact with who you are engaging with so that we can quickly respond if we need to. If people are physically dis distancing appropriately, wearing the masks that we want to have available to give out, and peacefully protesting, we feel like we could um, do what we need to uh, in supporting this. 
Governor, on the continuation of the emergency uh, declaration, while, while some of it is to access federal resources, uh, returning to critics who say you've overstepped your authority during this crisis, when do you think we will no longer be in an emergency? Do you have some sort of criteria for that? Mm -hmm. And at what point might you cede some of these powers? I believe you started today by saying we're no longer in a daily crisis. Yeah, it's an excellent question. I don't know is the honest answer. The uh, President Trump extended the federal funding and use of the National Guard until August 21st, uh, which I appreciate. I think every governor appreciates. So I don't know. I don't know, Brian. And throughout this crisis, I have to take it a day at a time. My answer is not a minute more than necessary. Uh, but as long as we are still heavily reliant upon the National Guard, heavily reliant upon FEMA, heavily reliant upon federal funds, um, we're still having to move on a dime to address certain issues. You know, as long as we're not out of the woods, then I will have to keep this in effect. So I don't know. I have no desire to do this any longer than is necessary. Governor, oh, yes. Governor, is, um, is Providence right. Governor is Providence open tonight? I mean, you go by, it's very jarring. You see the PPAC is boarded up, Federal Hill is boarded up, Fox Point is boarded up. Mm. Is it open for a family that wants to come to Providence tonight to go out to dinner? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the mayor's curfew begins at nine o'clock, so that is in effect. Uh, but yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, listen, it's, I'm not going to pretend this isn't unsettling. As we sit here in PPAC, you hear the helicopters overhead. It is so unsettling. We've never lived through this before. So I would say, but they're there for our security. So uh, yes, absolutely, you should. There's a lot of businesses who are afraid. They are boarded up because they're afraid because the other night, we had a horrible night. There were people who came to Providence with the express goal of setting on fire and destroying a lot of these small businesses. So I can't fault these businesses for putting up the, you know, bordering, bordering their windows. Having said that, yes, absolutely, is the answer to your question. Now just, we we um, all received on our phone the public safety alert and it mentions Providence. Are more of these going to go out during the course of the day and how, how did that decision come about? Is that I, set by the state or by the city of Providence? Can you help me? Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, so that's a, a notice that went out by the city of Providence uh, and that's a decision that was made by presumably the city and their emergency management agency and they have the ability through their emergency management agency to push those kind of alert notifications so we don't we don't know of any future plans for those alerts and it wasn't generated out of our office was it just people now we're in providence did i receive it because i'm in providence or did that go out statewide uh, i can't speak to oh. exactly how they targeted but i know how those alerts work is that you can do a, a geography for a delivery of the message so that would be my presumption director smiley governor Mundo, and uh Director Alexander Scott, a question for each of you. Will you be out there uh, at the rally today, 4.30? I believe they are, yes, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think I am gonna be able to go. At four o'clock, I'm, I'm spending my entire, day, most of the day, uh, apart from working to get ready for this, listening to folks in the community. So I had the Black Lives Matter presser this morning. I just came from the Institute of Nonviolence. At four o'clock, I'm leading a meeting of our Equity Council. Um, so I don't think I will be there today, but many of my staff are, and I am fully, fully supportive of the cause. What do you advise people who are coming in from outside? I know this may be a question for the mayor or for uh, Commissioner Perry, but from your perspective, folks coming in from outside of Providence, there's really nowhere to park right now. How would you advise people participate in this rally? Everything seems to be closed down. Uh, you have, you know, I would say you, there are, you can find places to park. You, RIPTA is working. You know, I would probably consider taking a bus in, car, you know, carpooling, uh, 
parking someplace and walking into the city. I mean, everything now is more difficult, candidly, but now the combination of the COVID crisis and civil unrest is really a challenge. But there are plenty of ways for people to come. Like I was saying to John, the city is open. You know, come in early, grab a coffee, walk, take your time to walk. Um, we're going to do our best to, you know, make it so that people can participate. Governor, you mentioned executive, your executive orders. Um, NEFAC, the New England uh, First Amendment Coalition, and some other watchdog groups have asked you about lifting the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the APRA, the, the restriction on public records. When might you do that, and why haven't you responded to those letters? Uh, that executive order is not yet expired. I think that expires in a couple of weeks, so I'll deal with it at that time. I'm open to... Why, why no response to the letters? Uh, I haven't been aware of the letters, but um, look, the, AP, APRA, just for folks at home who wouldn't know what that is, it's, uh, it allows people to have access to public records. I have been very transparent and going to continue to be committed to transparency due to the fact that my team is incredibly busy. We haven't changed anything that makes access to public, that lessens access to public records. What my executive order did was give us some more time to respond. And so I'm going to look at it. And if the team, if we're in a plate, we're always going to respond. We're always going to give what is required by law. We often go above and beyond. All we said was that we needed a little more time to do it since everybody's super busy. So I hear you. I'm for transparency. If we think we can um, get rid of the extra time, I will. So I haven't, I haven't really studied it yet. I think, I, I think it doesn't expire for two weeks. Governor, this morning, um, that was quite extraordinary with the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And in talking to them afterwards, um, they, they complimented you on, on you listening to them and, and feeling, getting a sense of their perspective. Mm -hmm. In your conversations with them, you touched on it, but what really stood out to you that it was not a perspective you shared before you sat down and really listened with them? You know, I just, um, first of all, I should say, like, I'm not new to this work. Like, I didn't, I didn't just wake up a week ago realizing that we need to commit ourselves to racial justice. Now, I haven't been perfect, and there's a lot more to do, and I'll be the first to recognize all there is to do. But Brother Gary and I have had dialogue for years, right? And we've been working together on, you know, the Promise Program, raising the minimum wage, criminal justice reform. I'm so proud that I, as governor, led on criminal justice reform. So. The thing, though, to answer your question is, it's just the more time I spend talking to him and other people in the community, as I've been doing more and more, black people in the community, it's just amazing how profoundly they feel unheard and how real that is and how real their fear is. They're, it's just, it, the more you listen, the more you realize, like, man, we're doing a terrible job listening, you know, as a society, as leaders, as people who aren't of color. Like, God, we are just not hearing them. We are not hearing their anxiety, frustration, fear, daily encounters with racism. So it's just, uh, I guess, just a more personal realization that, God, we've got a lot more work to do. Can we just ask Dr. Scott, you're going to attend the rally? Yeah. Just your thought on, that was certainly extraordinary this morning, Black Lives Matter, partnership with the governor. What, what's the message that you're going to perhaps put out at the rally or that you'd like to see get out at the rally or protest, excuse me? We want to be present you know, with the community. We want to help people stay safe um, and also embrace the importance of raising the message, raising the point about racial injustice. It's often something, something that is swept under the carpet 
as we talk about disparities that exist and why certain communities are more impacted by COVID or um, domestic violence or other types of outcomes. And while our message has been, we need to look at the different environments and living conditions that people are in um, and recognize the different opportunities, the disproportionate opportunities that people have had access to. And we need to and are committed to doing better, calling out structural injustices such as institutional racism, such as many of the isms that occur, but really being able to speak clearly to the fact that people have been treated differently and have been given different opportunities because of the color of their skin. So that we can expose it, be uncomfortable in that, and use that discomfort as a motivator to make change. Dr. Alexander Scott, would you be willing to share if you've had any experiences uh, with racism, any here in Rhode Island in your time here and while you've been the director? Um, that is a, a personal question. You know, as the governor shared, experiences of racism uh, occur with people of color on a daily basis. Uh, much of it is institutionalized racism. Some of it can be individual racism, and some of it ends up being personalized racism because of what you experience day after day after day. I always appreciate sharing my mother's story who traveled from uh, Virginia to New York City um, as a young girl after her mother sadly passed away when she was 11. Uh, went to school in New York City from, uh, through her teenage years and uh, was told that the high school she could go to was only one that was available for people who could, um, who did, who could not be allowed to go to college. The high school she went to only allowed for uh, certain uh, outcomes, but did not allow her to be the teacher or the nurse that she wanted to be, and it was solely because of the color of her skin. What I also like about that story is what she did is she went to the vocational high school that she was sent to, graduated, um, began working, went to college at night, continued working, went to graduate school at night, continued working, and um, finished by actually retiring as director of nursing with a master's degree in public administration. So she took what was there and reshaped it to become stronger. And that's what's in my own fibers and what's true to all of us as a community. How can we take what we are seeing exposed here and make it work for us to do better. I have a question to the governor then. Uh, to, to respond, to follow up on the last two questions, what is it that you think has made this a different moment mm. in terms of the consciousness, of public consciousness of racism? I mean, it, it could be the video which has shocked many people, but then why did it shock people? Did it shock people because a lot of white people saw that video and just wouldn't have believed that that sort of thing existed unless they watched it in front of them? Whereas I think many black people were at least unsurprised by that mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. what, what is it that the last two dozen incidents did not produce this result and this one did? Yeah. Listen, I'm not sure I have an answer. Uh, I do agree it, it does feel different. It absolutely feels different. The video was shocking, uh, and, but as you say, um, sadly, it's not new or unique. Um, for me, one of the things that I see different is the activism and impatience and energy of young people. And I mean young people, like teenagers and 20 somethings, you know, younger people. And I, for me, it feels a little bit like what happened after the Parkland shootings. You know, I would often say, my God, how many people have to die 
at the hand of gun violence before we do something, even in our own state. I can't get the legislature to ban guns in schools year after year. And I would say to myself, what's it going to take? And then after Parkland, the young people put their foot down and said, enough is enough. We demand action. And we did see a lot of action, even here in Rhode Island. We finally got red flag legislation passed. I do see, I feel a little bit of that now. You know, this protest today is going to have a heavy component of students um, from the Providence Public School System. In the work that I've been doing, we've been doing with the Providence Public School System and the state takeover, I'm hearing impatience from young people who are saying enough is enough with the racism. And by the way, they're right. So I think that is a component of it. And they're pushing the rest of us appropriately to, to take some action. The other thing is at the, the protest uh, last weekend, it was very racially mixed and actually mixed by age. There were people there from 10 years old to probably 90 years old. It was a beautiful thing to behold. That's different too. You know, that is different to see the variety of races, ages, people from different communities focused on the issues at hand. And uh, I, so for me, that feels different too. Look, our challenge is, Okay, make do, make the changes. Our, you know, it's as you, someone said over there. Don't just talk about it. Do it. So I'm not sure. I don't know why, but I know for me it feels different. Are you optimistic? I am. I am. Up, I'm an eternal optimist. I think you have to be to be in this business. Um, but yes, I am optimistic, and I'm anxious to keep got to work. You know, to get going and get things done. In what you've been hearing from members of the community in the last week to 10 days, and before that, as you said, in your conversations, uh, what is your assessment of policing in Rhode Island? Uh, and what are you hearing people from people about their own experiences? And what would you, if you had to talk to police departments and the state police and the community, what would you, do you think there's any problems in Rhode Island? Yeah, of course there are. Uh, excellent question, though. I, as I said, I just came from a listening session um, in Providence talking to folks who live in the community, people who've been formerly incarcerated, people who work in the community, and I asked that exact question. And I've talked to a lot of people. The general assessment is it is better here than in many places, but we do have a lot of work to do. So there are other places around the country where you see, um, and I think I can, well, there are other places around the country where there is there are bigger problems. There are bigger problems. In Providence, I can speak to the Rhode Island State Police. They have done, worked very hard to have good community relationships with the community, working with the community, not against the community. Are there problems still? Absolutely. Do we need more training? Yes. Do we need more diversity in the police force? Yes. Should we move towards body cameras? Yes. Do we have to do a better job of cutting down on uh, racism, yes. So I am, in no way am I saying we are perfect. I'm gonna be crystal clear about that. But truthfully, I'm very, I feel very fortunate. I mean, in the city of Providence, I can't speak to it. You should talk to the mayor. But the, by and large, they have done a very good job working with the community, as they should, to work through these issues. And we don't see some of the, the frequency of the brutality that you see in other cities around the country. Governor, if I could quickly follow up, I'm just thinking back to your second inauguration, because that's the one I was at, where they placed the shield on around your neck and essentially... It's called a gorget. Pardon? It's, it's called a gorget. The I gorget think. around your neck. Are you the senior law enforcement official in Rhode Island? I'm trying to understand, I guess, the org chart, and if so, can you then single-handedly order barricades removed or state police or National Guard to not use rubber bullets, et cetera. Is that something that falls on your desk? Yeah. Uh, I am not a law enforcement official, so no, I am not a law enforcement official. I am the governor, and the colonel of the state police reports to me, as to, and I am the captain general of the Rhode Island National Guard. Um, having said that, in the same way that I don't tell Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott to practice medicine, and I rely upon her for her public health expertise, I do not tell Colonel Manny how to conduct police business or investigations. 
So, um, but, you know, I hold them accountable. And that is my job. Thank you, everyone. All right. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good weekend. Go out to dinner.